All right. Um, so we don't have much time to cover World War II. Um, we are looking at, um, I had initially only allowed a week, um, which would be the week of the 21st. Um, however, it, when I initially scheduled that, I did not realize that uh, the 21st was District UIL, and so early release for us, and that the 22nd, uh, I have a meeting that's going to keep me out all day. Um, and then I also did not consider the fact that the 25th is the Good Friday Bad Weather Day. Um, so these, so all of this means that I'm really only going to see each class once next week, um, which is not enough time to do World War II. And I kind of toyed with trying to do something in that short of time. I still think we're, we're, it's going to take a little bit longer than the one week I initially planned. I'm going to have to restructure a few things. Um, but I think fundamentally um, what we're going to do is you're going to listen to this lecture at home. You're going to do this, this note assignment. Um, we're going to have a discussion question discussion class on either the 23rd or the 24th. And then we'll see how that goes. And I'll probably on the 28th or so, um, we'll probably do something along the lines of um, kind of a discussion-based activity. Um, at some point, you will have a uh, quiz over World War II, um, but I don't know whether I'll do that maybe on Wednesday the 30th or something like that, or maybe I'll push it off until April 1st. Um, so anyways, we'll just kind of, kind of wing it a little bit, um, especially when we're talking about that last week of March. Um, and try to figure out what's the best way to really cover World War II. My, my plan is that you're going to listen to the lecture and I'm going to cover the high points. I'm going to hit the stuff that I know you need to know for the STAR test. Um, and it's not just the STAR test. I mean, I, I mentioned the STAR test because you need to be prepared for it because you have to pass it to graduate. Um, however, um, this is also kind of the, the main ideas um, that anybody in a survey class should know um, and be familiar with. These are kind of the essentials, if you will, of World War II. And so I think that um, we're going to cover that uh, here through kind of a flipped lesson. And then when you come in on the 23rd or the 24th, if you're a B-Day, um, and I see you, you should have these notes finished. Um, when you turn that in, you can get up to five points for that. Um, which is very simple, very kind of middle school level activity, okay, which is why I'm not giving it a whole lot of points. Um, then the next part is going to be you're, you're going to come up with a discussion question. Um, and we're going to put everybody's discussion questions together, and I'm just going to kind of start going through them and answering them um, and seeing what kind of discussions we can spark uh, in class. Um, you know, if, if I have, and I've got a couple of classes that are not big talkers, um, and in those classes, we may end up getting through pretty much all the discussion questions. Um, and if we have a very talkative class, it may take us a little bit longer. We'll just kind of play it by ear. Um, and what, I, what my intention with the discussion question is that it's your opportunity to ask a question about World War II that you really are just curious about. And some of that, if you're not a big history person, maybe that just comes from looking at these different terms and wondering, okay, what exactly is this? And what exactly happened with that? And why does this matter, right? Um, so it may be tied very directly to these notes, or maybe you're a big World War II buff, or maybe you've seen Saving Private Ryan a gazillion times, or um, you watched Fury, and so you really want to know some information about... Um, how things how things were um, during World War II. So my idea is that this is going to give you an opportunity to talk about that. Um, and then hopefully we'll have at least one more class where we can kind of do some document activities, I'm thinking. Um, I've got a documents strewn all over my desk right now trying to decide which ones I want to do. Because um, I literally could spend another, you know, three weeks doing this. Um, and unfortunately, we just don't have time, right? Um, and that is the nature of a survey class, and especially a dual credit one where we have that, that pesky little star test that's coming up at the end of April. Um, so, uh, all that to be said, you need to be sure that you're going through these terms, that you're answering them, and again, this doesn't have to be super detailed. It needs to be an identification, um, kind of clearly indicating that you understand what the topic is and why it matters. Um, and then, um, and then we'll just go from there. Um, so let me go back. This is like my third attempt at recording this. Um, so I'm a little bit off. Um, all right, so now we're going to talk, and I'm going to try to 
bring up things that are not listed on the PowerPoint in front of you. Obviously, you can read the PowerPoint. You can you can see what what I typed there. Um, and so I'm going to try to give you the stuff that's not listed directly or only focus on the things that I think are really, really important. Um, and obviously, um, we're covering a great deal of information here. Um, one of the things about World War II for the United States um, is that it's very much for U.S. history, rather. It's very much focused on what is happening here at home. Yes, there are some global implications. Yes, we are going to talk some about a few key battles. Um, but a lot of what we're going to talk about is going to be tied directly to war mobilization and fighting a war on two fronts and, you know, the events that really sucked us in and, and how we managed to maintain neutrality um, until really late to the very end of 1941, even though Europe had already been embroiled in war since uh, 1939. So um, so that's what we're going to be looking at. I'm probably going to break this up into a couple of different lectures um, because obviously if you glance through this PowerPoint, it's like 125 slides, which would be, you know, a two and a half hour lecture. I'm not going to do that to you. Uh, I'm going to break it into some bite-sized chunks. Um, and we'll just kind of see. Um, so this, in case you're confused, this is obviously the first one. Um, and uh, we'll just kind of get going until I feel like I've talked for a long enough amount of time and come to a good stopping place. Um, so the first thing that I want to mention is, and I touched on this at the end of the 1930s, um, the end of the 1930s uh, Great Depression kind of, you know, PowerPoint, New Deal kind of stuff. And I was talking about how um, it's it's really the preparation for World War II that, that brings about the end of the Great Depression. For all that the New Deal um, did brand new things with the role of government in the economy for all that it really, um, you know, changed people's expectations of the government. It created Social Security, which was groundbreaking, and you have new concepts about regulation and all this sort of thing. We have a new idea about federal power, and we have another very strong president, right? Um, understand that it's not until you have this this excuse to get ready for war um, that we see that Congress in particular is willing to spend the kind of money that needs to be spent to stimulate the kind of job growth that is needed. Um, and, you know, for the United States, unlike some of the other countries that relied on military um, growth as a way to get out of economic circumstances. I mean, that's true for the United States. The difference is what comes first, right? If you're talking about someplace like Germany, for example, um, you're talking about a country that starts building their military before they're actually even engaged in conflict uh, and building up their military in direct violation to the Treaty of Versailles. Um, so for the United States, um, you know, it was a little different kind of chronology there. Um, but understand it was military spending. Um, it was soldier, you know, men getting drafted. It was men going into service. It's, you know, creating this, this need, right, for, um, uh, for people, for, for jobs and for people to take over those, those positions uh, in the factories and stuff. Um, so that's a very important piece of, of how we, how World War II shapes up for the United States. Um, and the other concept that I think really matters, too, with World War II is that you have this notion of democracy as an ideology, not, you know, and we touched on it a little bit when we looked at World War I, but at that point it was still very kind of new. Woodrow Wilson talked about making the world safe for democracy, that he wanted democracy to be this grand ideal, um, but to some extent he didn't think you could export democracy. He wanted to create the circumstances around the world that made democracy favorable, right? This was why he wanted to end colonial possessions and have freedom of seas and all that kind of stuff. Well, obviously, because of the Treaty of Versailles, that goal you know goes away, right? Nobody's interested in that. And so that's why we can say after World War I, you don't really have that focus on... Um, on democracy as an ideology that you can export, you can take somewhere, right? 
Um, what we see in World War II is the idea of democracy as something you can take to somebody. You can give them democracy. Remember that in imperialism, our attitude was, well, these undeveloped countries, they're not ready for democracy. We have to teach them. We have to train them. And this was our big justification for imperialism. Um, very different attitude in World War II. Um, that we can take democracy to them, we can give them democracy, and then they know what to do with it, right? Um, and this is a very profound shift uh, in kind of American foreign policy. And in fact, we haven't left that idea. Um, the whole reason we get involved in places all over the world, the whole reason we complain about human rights violations and that kind of thing has exactly to do with the fact that we think we should somehow influence democracy in other places, especially other places that maybe aren't as good at democracy as the United States is. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind. The other competing ideas that we have during the 1930s are going to be communism and fascism. And I touched on this a little bit at the end of the Great Depression, New Deal stuff. Um, understand that communism really has its roots going back to the middle of the 1800s, the emergence of industrialization. Um, however, it doesn't become the communism that we're familiar with, the 20th century version of communism. As I mentioned before, that mutation of Karl Marx's ideas, it doesn't become that until you have the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. When the Bolsheviks take over uh, in October of 1917, and then they go through a couple of years of civil war trying to con consolidate their power, what you're going to have is the Bolsheviks becoming the, the Communist Party, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. And the whole gist behind communism, as I mentioned before, is that you have a single strong authoritarian party that dictates everything having to do with the country, having to do with the economy. The idea is that we can force industrialization, we can force collectivization, we can define for everybody, this is your role, this is your job, this is what you're going to be doing, right? So this is the whole idea. Um, communism does rely on military spending, but its its military spending is often in very much kind of a defensive kind of position. Um, communism, especially as we see it happening in the Soviet Union and to to some degree even in China later on after this after World War II, is very much focused on we want to defend ourselves, we want to maintain influence, we want to maintain buffer zones so those pesky capitalists can't extend their influence inside our main country. And so it's really all about influence, that hegemony, right? Um, trying to shape the world around them um, so that their main country can stay solidly communist. Because remember, the whole deal about communism is that one single party has to be in control. Everybody has to do what that party's saying. And, you know, and, and remember that the only way you can have any sort of class differentiation, if you even want to call it that, is going to be by taking a leadership role within the party. So, for example, if you're Vladimir Lenin, if you're Leon Trotsky, if you're Joseph Stalin, you're very clearly at the leadership level, and you live a better life than everybody else does. Um, now, everybody has to be a part of the Communist Party, because otherwise you aren't going to get a job or anything else like that. Um, but you definitely see kind of this idea of organization and structure that's dictated by the party, the state runs everything. We don't have private ownership, uh, at least not of anything significant. Um, you don't have privately owned farms. You don't have privately owned factories. You don't have, you know, privately owned businesses or anything like that. Um, in contrast with fascism, what you're going to see, and fascism is going to rely on military spending too, but that notion is going to be very much we want a strong team to root for, right? Fascism is really going to take off in countries that kind of have that little man complex, um, that feel like somehow they've lost some prestige or that they need to consolidate support within their country. So the idea is going to be if we get, um, you know, if we get a big military, we start trying to take over territory, we start trying to influence people, we kind of bow up at people a little bit, kind of threaten them. Um, it's very much kind of a bully mentality, if you want the honest truth. Um, you know, don't make us come into your country and take what we want kind of stuff, right? And it's really about gaining support and gaining kind of a nationalistic fervor. And you see, you've seen that at times in the United States, where we believe the United States is perfect and kind of the notion of manifest destiny. Hello? Uh, yes, kind of. 
Okay. Uh, 85. Yes. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Bye-bye. Sorry for that interruption, guys. I am not stopping this and re-recording. Oh, my goodness. I've had so many interruptions. All right. Um, so what you see with fascism is that, um, is that people are trying to build up that support. They're trying to get, um, they're trying to get some kind of, um, you know, fervor going. And the United States has, oh, I was talking about Manifest Destiny. The United States has had that, um, when we believe we should be entitled to the entire, you know, you know, continental United States. Um, or even to some extent when we believe that we should be able to influence the Western Hemisphere, a la the Roosevelt Corollary. Um, you know, you have these kind of examples of that, but the United States doesn't quite, I mean, I don't know, there's a, there's a lack of raw aggression, I guess. Um, a lot of times, and of course maybe people can interpret, not maybe, but people do, interpret the Spanish-American War as being largely one of, you know, American aggression, and I, I mean, you can definitely see that. Um, and uh, certainly the Latin American countries felt with U.S. influence, or Mexico for that matter, felt the U.S. was being a little bit aggressive. But remember that with the exception of the acquisitions after the Spanish-American War, the U.S. doesn't really take other territories. We'll install somebody that we approve. We'll create kind of a protectorate or we'll kind of have that, use that same kind of hegemony approach that communism does. Um, but it's all in the, the name of capitalism, right? And there's still kind of a, a healthy degree of, you know, individualism and private ownership and that kind of thing. Um, so you, you have with fascism um, this absolute desire to kind of make sure our country is the best. And again, like I said, these are often countries that, you know, have been challenged. In the case of Italy, Italy was a young country. They were late on board with World War I. They didn't get to have as much global influence as they wanted. Um, and so they're going to very quickly say, hey, let's, you know, let's build up our military. Italy's great. We're going to make Italy awesome. We're going to make a new Roman Empire. And hey, this is going to mean that we control the Mediterranean. And it's going to mean that we invade North Africa. And so that's what you see Italy doing. And this starts happening very early in the 1920s. Um, and again, it's a way of kind of controlling and consolidating uh, the economic concerns and the social concerns. Um, you see the same thing happening in Japan. Um, Japan had rapidly industrialized, if you remember back to us talking about the initial interactions with Japan um, and how Japan had become very concerned about the influence of the United States. They wanted to compete with the United States. They wanted to be better than that. And they really felt that uh, the Treaty of Versailles had kind of disrespected them uh, and what their interests were in the Pacific uh, and in Southeast Asia. Because remember, Japan is... A small country, um, and as a small country, they don't have the resources. And we know by now, resources are crucial to industrialization. Um, and so you definitely see that that's going to be a, a major piece of Japan. Now, with Germany, it's it's a similar kind of thing, right? Um, where they're needing resources, and I'll show you a map here in a second. Um, and and you can see right there the terms that that explain it. The, the deal with fascism is you're going to have a single dictator. Now the dictator is going to is going to be kind of the embodiment of the nation. Um, he's going to be the guy that represents everybody um, and he's going to basically run the country like a dictatorship. Now fundamentally the Communist Party does the same thing in the Soviet Union. However, they're doing it kind of through this idea of collectivization and this is what's good for everybody and the party knows what's best, right? In the case of, of Germany in particular, but, and, but also uh, Italy with Mussolini and with Japan, you're going to have this idea that, that the nation is embodied in a single person. In Germany's case, it's Hitler. Italy, it's Mussolini. In Japan, it's the emperor. Um, and you definitely see that, um, that those individuals have a huge influence um, in how that country runs. Um, and the other important distinction is that with fascism, Private ownership and private participation, private individualism is permissible as long as you serve the state, right? I can be a business owner, but I better serve the state the way the state needs me. And if that means that I make, you know, 
if I make, you know, bullets, that means I make bullets. If that means I make, um, you know, guns, that means I make guns. If that means I make, you know, cookware, I make cookware, right? If you're a woman, what that means is I serve my country best by helping morale. Um, I serve my country best by having more children to have more soldiers because, you know, we're going to have this great, you know, glorious empire and we're going to have this Third Reich or whatever, you know, in the case of uh, Mussolini, this new Roman Empire, that kind of thing. And so that you have this perception that individuals are supposed to serve the nation. Um, and so it, and so there's some room in fascism for private ownership um, that there is not through communism. Um, and so I think that that's a very important distinction that you have there. And so these are big ideas uh, that have to do with the different types of government that we have um, that are really influencing things in the 1930s. And very clearly, the 1930s, I mentioned this before, um, you have strong governments emerging everywhere. The fact that the United States manages to hold on to democracy is truly, truly amazing. Um, and in fact, gives us a great deal of hope for the future. Um, so the next thing I want to touch on um, is that you've got a Europe that was very destroyed after World War I. You have a lot of egos that are bruised. You have a lot of national identities that are either brand new nations, brand new national identities, or they, they've been battered, right? Like Germany, for instance. Um, in the case of Italy, uh, they, they feel very kind of disrespected. They feel like, you know, their economy is in shambles after World War I. Um, and so that's going to be a huge issue. And then you've got this whole, that pesky Dawes plan uh, that I mentioned back, way back uh, when we talked about uh, the Great Depression and or rather the 1920s. And the deal with the Dawes plan is going to be that, you know, U.S. banks were loaning money to Germany to make their reparation payments. They were making reparation payments to Britain and France who were then making loan payments to the United States. Well, that's all well and good as long as this little cycle never gets broken. But what will happen is that a combination of factors. First off, you're going to have Germany start to have increasing trouble paying back their reparation payments, even with loans. They're going to undergo this period of hyperinflation, if you will. Uh, matter of fact, I'll show you the picture of hyperinflation um, to kind of give, give you a sense of what I'm talking about. Um, here's children actually playing with money um, because it's cheaper than buying toys, right? That's how much money you saw. Um, let's see, there's somebody sweeping loose money in the streets, for example. Um, somebody painting their walls with money. Um, here's somebody taking a wheelbarrow um, to buy money. Um, burning it for fuel, making a kite out of it. Um, so you get the idea, right? We're talking about a pretty significant taking, you know, baskets full of money um, into the bank, right? Because that's that's how worthless the German mark was. Um, and so you definitely see Germany has, uh, as this major inflation comes in, they can't keep making these loan payments. Um, and so they start scaling back, which means Britain and France start scaling back. Well, then you start to have the economic situation in the United States of the late 1920s, early 1930s. And then when American banks start to really fail in the early 1930s, um, there's no money to loan out, right? So you've got kind of this vicious cycle. As long as everything, as long as we were, you know, playing, you know, robbing Peter to pay Paul and nobody knew any better, um, it was all great. But then when everything starts to unravel, um, that creates a major problem. Um, and you have kind of, thanks to World War I, you had these very interconnected global economies. This was the irony of the United States trying to become isolationist in the 1920s. Um, that genie wasn't going back in the bottle, right? The United States was now globally involved. Um, it had markets and interests all over the world. And that wasn't going to change just because people were upset that they had gotten sucked into a conflict, right? Um, so that's a huge part of it. Um, and then you definitely see um, this whole idea of the impact of industrialization, not only in creating economies and markets, but you also have 
the notion of creating wealth or in the case of Germany's hyperinflation, losing wealth overnight because now the, the thousands of dollars you've saved up are basically worthless, right? Um, so you're going to have this middle class group that, that starts to feel very vulnerable during the economic crisis of the 1930s. And in Germany in particular, you have a military that has been completely dismantled. Um, and understand that for Germany, that kind of militaristic uh, Prussian soldier kind of mentality was very much part of their machismo, for lack of a better word. Um, and so that's what you're going to see happening. Um, and so be sure that you kind of have those main concepts in place. Um, and a lot of these countries, like I said, they're very new. Um, the impact of industrialization, um, the, the, the threats, the threat to your wealth. The, the, and, you know, I was telling a friend uh, this weekend, you know, that it's economic instability that leads to political turmoil, right? And so when people feel economically vulnerable, they're going to tend to embrace radical ideas, right? Um, and so you certainly see that. Now, understand in Europe, right, that the expectations are a little bit different. Europe is not the same as the United States. The United States is a much stronger kind of strain of individualism, and I want to take care of myself, and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to work hard and be successful, and kind of this promise of opportunity. Even during the Great Depression, there's this hope that if we can just figure out how to stop the bleeding, we can go back to finding that level of opportunity, right? I mean, everything about the New Deal is about letting people access opportunity. Um, and so I think that that's very important to grasp, and that's why you see in Europe a different type of radicalism, uh, although certainly there were some conservatives in the U.S. that thought FDR's New Deal was pretty radical, um, but in comparison it certainly was not. Um, and that's because of the difference, the level of experience with democracy, and kind of just a different attitude about individualism um, that, was, that was different in Europe. Um, here's some pictures of Vladimir Lenin, uh, Joseph Stalin. Joseph Stalin's the guy with the lovely mustache. Um, and again, kind of remember back to what I told you about the Russian Revolution. Um, you're going to see that that by 19, I think it's 24, uh, Lenin has died, Trotsky's been exiled, and Stalin basically emerges as the single leader of the party. Um, and, you know, he, as the single leader of the party, he, you know, controls the agenda. Um, and yes, he's a dictator, but he's a dictator within a party. Um, and everything he's doing is about forcing collectivization, forcing industrialization. Um, this perception is that Germ uh, not Germany, that the Soviet Union has fallen behind other countries, and they have to catch up. Um, you also have a little bit of a concern about um, you know you have a long-standing kind of animosity between Russia and Germany going into the 1930s and that kind of thing. Um, and one of the things I want to point out about Joseph Stalin is he's not a nice guy. Yes, he's going to be the, our ally in World War II. Um, one of the concepts you have to take from World War II is, you know, the, the what is it, the, en the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Um, and that absolutely holds true, right? Um, and so we see that the United States, and, and you know, Historians debate all the time, you know, maybe maybe FDR was able to kind of, you know, see into, you know, he and Stalin were able to get some things done because they had a better understanding with each other. Um, it's hard to know exactly since, you know, FDR died and um, was dead before the end of World War II. We certainly know that Justice Stalin did not get along well with Truman and that this it's this tension that's going to lead to the Cold War. But certainly going from the years of, you know, the late 1930s into the 1940s, um, we see Stalin emerging as being somebody who's, who's at least willing to work with us. Um, of course, that's ironic because the U.S. had put a lot of, you know, under Woodrow Wilson had tried to arrange for the overthrow of the Bolshevik Party. Um, you know, so again, you know, it, it's this time of crisis that's going to make us friendly with them. Um, Stalin was very harsh to his own people. Um, you can see right there he kills a lot of Russian peasants um, because he believes, you know, you either get on board or you die. Um, you know, if you don't like collectivization, then I guess you don't get to eat, right? Um, and, oh, the, you know, in this collectivization process, we have to save up so much wheat for our soldiers in case they ever have to go to war. And, oh, hey, if that's going to make 
you know, your particular community go hungry and you're going to have people dying of starvation, well, too bad for you. Um, and so he's very harsh with his own people. Um, and, you know, for Stalin, the, the agenda was not about what is your ethnicity, what is your religion, you know, you don't look the right way, you don't sound the right, what, right way, your, you know, background is different. It wasn't about that for Stalin. It was, are you on board with him? Are you doing what he wants? Are you cooperating? Are you part of the party? Um, and as long as those things were true, you were probably going to be okay. Um, and so that's, that's what's kind of interesting. Now, understand Stalin was kind of crazy, right? He was very unpredictable. There was no way to know for sure what was going to happen or, you know, anything like that. So, um, just kind of keep that in mind, um, that just because I say he was an equal opportunity kind of killer slash dictator, um, doesn't mean that, that he was easy to predict, um, one of the great ironies of Stalin is that when he dies in like 1954 or whatever it is, um, in the early 1950s, um, what's going to happen is that that he has a stroke, basically, and he's like laying on the floor of his bedroom, and there's no doctors that will come in and treat him because they're terrified that if they misdiagnose him or if they treat him poorly or he doesn't recover or he doesn't recover well enough, that he's that they're going to get blamed, um, and so it's it's really super ironic that you know he kind of sets himself up for that sort of thing. Um, understand he's incredibly paranoid and incredibly hard to deal with. Um, so just be sure you kind of know about him. I think it's worthwhile to understand kind of the differences between um, these different dictators, especially because um, it's just it just helps you be a smarter person. Um, so we're probably I'm probably wandering around in a little bit of world history that I shouldn't have to do for, uh, you know, for U.S. history, but I'm going to do it anyways. Um, Mussolini, um, the big thing, you see there's Mussolini with Hitler right there. Um, Mussolini, I mentioned already that Italy was a young country. Um, they had just unified as a country in the 1870s. Um, you know, they were always kind of a day late and a dollar short to every kind of global conference or whatever. Um, so they really kind of felt disrespected. And the whole economic crisis um, of the 20s and 30s hits them particularly hard. Um, and so the post-World War I kind of economic depression. And so what's going to happen is that Mussolini is going to come in and he's going to take this idea of fascism. And he's really going to be the first fascist leader. Um, now, obviously, Hitler's going to, you know, do it do that better than he does. But um, but what you see is that Mussolini comes in, he consolidates power, he starts talking about raising a military and taking territory, and everything's pretty hunky-dory for a little while. Um, and of course, he's going to sign that, you know, the Axis, and he and Germany are going to be all, you know, best buds and all that kind of stuff. And that's all well and good until finally, and I think it's roughly around, what, 1842-ish, maybe 1843, uh, the Italian people get tired of war. They're, they've been, you know, Mussolini's been dragging them into North Africa, and now he's got us involved in fighting, you know, this major, you know, conflict. And there's kind of this ad idea that, you know, we're tired of him, and we're tired of his, of his nonsense, and he's basically not taking care of our interests. And so they basically, like, overthrow Mussolini uh, in the middle of World War II, um, and then Germany has to basically come in, rescue him, put him back in power. Uh, and in fact, my husband and I have talked that that probably one of the reasons why Germany was not as able to defeat the Soviet Union. And when we talk about kind of the sweep of the Soviets uh, into Germany, one of the reason why, reasons why the Germans weren't as prepared for that is because they were having to divert resources to Italy to help keep Mussolini in power. Um, you know, and so Mussolini is not, uh, you know, he's not the best leader ever, um, but he is kind of this idea of nationalism, uh, and he definitely is a major player. Um, and when we're talking about, you know, the U.S. getting involved in the war, you have to understand that in 1939, 1940, uh, the idea of Germany and Italy being on the same side was a pretty scary notion, especially for places like France, for instance, or controlling the Mediterranean. Um, so yeah, it was pretty scary. Um, Hitler, of course, lots of pictures of him. He is, of course, the, the, the name everybody knows, um, kind of sound a little bit like Voldemort. Um, but he is, uh, he, he comes to power in Germany. And again, same kind of MO as with Italy. 
Germany had been horribly dismantled, horribly uh, humiliated after World War I. You have lots of World War I soldiers that had basically, I and mean, pe people used to spit on them, right? They used to, like, how did you get us involved in this war, right? You also have uh, in Germany this Weimar Republic um, that's, you know, Germany was not experienced. They had been a monarchy for a long time. They were not experienced with the parliamentary system. And so the issue with the way the parliament ran was that you had to have a coalition government. So whichever party won the most seats would dominate kind of the parliament. But there was room for lots of different parties. So what you have is kind of this frequent changing uh, in the parliament of who's actually in charge. And so it creates kind of this craziness. And you have this emergence of lots of different political parties, um, very different from what we have in the United States. Um, and so Germany's really struggling during this period, and it's into this that you're going to see the National Socialist German Workers' Party. Um, and again, kind of have a little bit of a, of a naming sleight of hand there. They're actually fascist, right? That's why the National's there. Um, but notice they kind of throw that socialist in there, and they talk about workers. Like, are they communist? Are they fascist? What are they, right? Um, and don't think that's not for, that. that there's that's a coincidence, right? Um so what will happen is Hitler, of course, serves in World War I, feels very dis disheartened and upset by Germany's defeat, um, and joins this early party, um, he and Ernst Strom and a few others, and, and really indications are that the initial membership in the early 1920s was very small, like 50 or 100 people, right? Um, and they, they doctor up their roles. This is going to sound very typical of the Nazis as well. They doctor up their, their, their paperwork, their roles, to make it look like they've got thousands of members. Um, anyway, so he kind of decides that he's going to gain some support for his party um, by marching on Munich, trying to trigger kind of like a coup or trying to get his party some attention and get some focus on in the parliament. And, um, you know, people aren't really sure, like, what he... Well, they aren't really sure. They... The why he would try to take over Munich City Hall um, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I mean, Munich, I guess, I mean, it is kind of a, a classic seat of kind of, uh, of German power. Um, but, you know, really, did he think he was going to, everyone was going to rise up and support him? It's hard to know. Um, anyways, he gets arrested for this and gets thrown into jail. Um, now, understand that when I say he's thrown into jail, it's not like he's, forced into hard labor or anything, okay? This is a guy that's basically sitting pretty comfy. He only serves about eight months. He's allowed to write. So it's basically a vacation, right? I mean, he's, his food is prepared. I mean, the, the biggest discomfort he has is that, you know, he has to stay in a small cell. Um, and so he writes his book, Mein Kampf, where he basically lays out this agenda um, for this is why Germany lost World War I, and this is how we can make Germany great again. Um, and so this is kind of his plan. Um, and so he starts talking about unifying territories that Germany had lost um, and essentially saying, you know, we want, um, you know, we want Aryan superiority, that the whole reason Germany's become weak is because we let too many, too many foreigners come in and we, you know, diluted the bloodline and all this kind of stuff. So he finishes his term. He comes out of, out of jail. I think it's like 1924 or something. Um, maybe it's 25. Um, and he comes out, and he basically has printed this book. No, nobody really takes it very seriously. Everyone's kind of like, oh, yeah, that's Hitler. He tried to do that whole beer hall putsch kind of thing. And, you know, he doesn't, you know, he's just kind of a weirdo, and he talks all this crazy smack, and um, everyone just kind of, you know, shrugs and giggles about him, right? Uh, but he starts to build some support, particularly among some, for, some former military guys, um, and they start to, you know, use some intimidation, um, and they start to arrange some violence and that kind of thing, um, you know, and they blame it on the communists and they blame it on the ineffectiveness of the Weimar Republic and see, this is why everything's so upside down and you need us to come in and we're going to maintain strength. Um, and so this is how they start turning people over to the kind of the Nazi agenda. In addition, what he's going to do is he's going to talk about, um, these ideas of, um, you know, that, 
that not only that the Weimar Republic is weak, um, but that you know, they need to start working through the parliamentary system. So the Nazi party becomes a for real working political party that starts campaigning and gaining seats in the parliament, and they start increasing momentum. And at first, there's a lot of people who number either don't like the Communist Party or they, they're very frustrated with the Weimar Republic. And so they're, they're buying into the rhetoric that the Nazis are going to be there, that they're going to make things strong. Longer, they're going to make it better. Um, and there's kind of this idea of, yeah, they talk some crazy stuff about Aryan superiority and they blame the Jews, and I don't know that I buy that. But, you know, hey, I mean, they, they, they can't really be serious about that. We all know how important Jewish Jews are to the economy of Germany, so they can't really be serious about that. And, and well, you know, hey, if they, they spook the communists away, um, then, they're, then we can take advantage of what they're willing to do that we aren't willing to do, um, and we can let them make the communists leave, and then we can kind of control them, if you will. Um, and so I think that this is how he begins to gain some support. And what will happen is that by 1932, um, you know, he's got a lot of support um, through a variety of social classes. It's not just the workers anymore. Um, you're going to have lots of people. And he talks a lot about building up the military and, and ignoring the Treaty of Versailles. And that the Treaty of Versailles was this great crime and all this kind of stuff. And he really kind of talks some trash about all of that. And people really buy it. So by 1932, the Nazis are the largest party in parliament. So they're being elected into office. And yes, is, is everyone, you know, gung-ho Nazi? Not necessarily. Um, but to some extent, people think they can control them. And that will continue to be the case until you hit about 1934, 1935. And then, and then there's going to be a, a, a significant group of Germans that realize, oh, crap. These people really are just as crazy as they sound. And by then it's too late. They can't get control of the situation anymore. Um, so I think it's very important for you to kind of understand that. You also see this idea of him using violence. He uses um, the, the SA, uh, the stormtroopers. He also, later on, they'll become the SS. Or they don't become, but SS is created separately. Um, and so there's lots of violence and intimidation. Like I said, there's a, a lot of it, this is manufactured, right? Where they kind of arrange for bad things to happen to kind of make the system look very destabilized. Um, and so what will happen is that Hitler will become Fuhrer um, in what, 1934, 35, something like that. Um, right about the time that they really kind of solidify. They solidify their power in the Reichstag um, in 32. Hindenburg holds on for another year or two. Um, and then that's when he's going to become, while Hindenburg, Hindenburg's around, he's chancellor, and then after Hindenburg dies, he becomes Fuhrer. Um, one of the end, other interesting side notes, if you've seen that, that movie Race about Jesse Owens, um, the 1936 Berlin Olympics are really kind of notable. One of the reasons, I think, uh, that the Nazis managed to, to, managed to kind of solidify their power a little bit uh, tend to the, the why the global community can kind of you know shrug their shoulders and say yeah well you know I don't know I mean they're doing some good things right I mean you have to understand there were a lot of people in the United States and all over the world that believed that that Hitler was was right um, that you know that the Treaty of Versailles was was horrible that it was unfair. Um, and that he was right to be mad about it, and you had people that looked at his level of control and kind of were very afraid of communism. So you have a lot of people that really kind of think maybe he's doing some good work. Um, and, you know, part of why they're, he's able to have that sort of support is because the 1936 Berlin Olympics, right? Um, first off, you've got the, the spending to get ready for the Olympics, right? The building programs and all that kind of stuff that's going to happen. Uh, cleaning up of the streets and the, the, the job growth that's going to happen by because of a major event like that. So that's going to help the German economy. And, of course, the Nazis are going to be able to take credit for that. Um, and then the other aspect of it, too, is you're going to see that, especially during going in 1935, 1936, um, the Nazis are really going to kind of back off of some of their really violent rhetoric and some of that. And that's not to say there's not violence still happening. There is. Um, but they're at least going through the motions of trying to do something about it or looking into it or, you know, and you don't see them wholesale rounding up Jews, right? 
Um, and now, the, again, that means there is oppression. They are kind of challenging people. But there's this kind of this lulling period uh, because of the Olympics um, that people just kind of think, well, it's not going to be that bad. Um, that's one of the reasons why so many Jews end up staying in Germany. Uh, and that and Germany makes it very difficult for them to leave, even though they claim they want them all to leave. Um, mostly because they want to keep all the wealth within, in Germany itself. Um, and so you definitely see that, um, you know, that this is going to be part of why Jews stay. This is going to be part of why the United States kind of ignores kind of the early warning signs and that kind of thing. Um, so just kind of be sure that you're aware of that. I think it's a very interesting idea um, about, uh, it, about kind of how Hitler comes in and solidifies his power. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you as well um, is this map of kind of Germany after the Treaty of Versailles. Um, when I said that, that Germany had lost, you know, key industrial resources, what I'm talking about is this area right here that looks kind of like a thumb. Czechoslovakia was a new country that had been created because of the Treaty of Versailles, and they basically take that section and they say, here you go, Czech Czechoslovakia, um, this belongs to you. In Germany, you don't get to use that anymore. I understand that the people that lived here in what's called Sudetenland is... Um, is an area that's German speaking. They're ethnically German. Um, I mean, these were German citizens until the Treaty of Versailles, and then all of a sudden they're not. They're Czechoslovakians, right? And they're not super happy about that. And understand that there's kind of this long history uh, between kind of the Germans, the 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 people of kind of that Prussian ancestry, um, feeling a little bit superior to people of kind of the the Slovak, right? Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, those kind of areas. Um, the, the Slavic countries that had kind of that relationship with Russia, if you think back to World War I. Um, and so when that area is taken away from them, they lose some important industrial resources. And that's going to limit their ability to recover economically. And this is one of the reasons why you're going to see such so much resentment about the loss of Sudetenland. And so one of the things very early on he's going to say is, you know, you people have hampered us from recovering from World War I by taking away this key area. The other thing they're going to be upset about is Alsace and Lorraine, another industrial resource kind of area. I think it had lots of coal in it. Um, and so Germany is going to feel very angry about that. Germany had controlled that Alsace and Lorraine from the Pr Franco-Prussian War until you get to World War I, and then France takes it back. And they say, oh, no, this was always ours. And yes, those areas are ethnically French. Um, but remember that Germany had pretty much been in control of that for some time. Um, so, yeah, they're kind of upset um, about the loss of Alsace and Lorraine and the, the damage that it's doing to their economy. Um, and then you also see these other yellow territories where they, they lost some places. Um, Poland is given this access uh, into, uh, into the Baltic Sea, um, and they lose that territory that was once Germany. Um, so they're mad about that. Um, and so you can see why, why people tended to look at the Treaty of Versailles and say, oh, well, you know, gee, maybe, maybe there is a good excuse um, for what was happening and that kind of thing. Um, so I just wanted to be sure you saw that picture. The next thing I wanted to show you is a picture. Um, this, oops, come back here has to do with Japan. Um, and I mentioned before, and yes, those are dead babies, um, and yes, those are bodies of dead women. Uh, that is not the emperor, that is uh, the admiral, um, Tojo. And Tojo uh, was the guy in charge of really kind of the bulk of the military, that the navy, which of course was a key part of Japanese strength. Um, and so you're going to have, unlike the other fascist powers, in Japan, you've really got kind of a two-headed snake. You've got the emperor on one hand, who very clearly is um, kind of the embodiment of Japan. But he also kind of works with, is, you know, and, and depending on which version you hear, to some extent people say that he was held accountable to the military. Maybe, maybe not. Um, Again, that there's different interpretations. There's been a little bit of historical revision uh, because after World War II, we wanted to have Japan as kind of our ally in the Pacific. Um, and so we let them keep their emperor, and we kind of remake that story a little bit. Um, just understand that you have the emperor um, and kind of the, the head of the, the navy being in charge. 
Um, and really, one of the things uh, my husband and I have talked about many times is that the real beginning of World War II is not the invasion of Poland in 1939. It's not even kind of the beginning of the unification efforts that happened in 37 and 38 uh, and the policy of appeasement. It really starts with Japan. Right, um, you're going to see here that Japan starts invading Manchuria, which I'll show you um, really quickly a map of kind of what what I'm talking about. So here's Japan, right? This little small island right there, and this is where you saw kind of China. Um, so very early in '31, you see Japan going into Manchuria, taking over this area, really kind of dominating Korea, and all of this is meant to um, essentially. Um, you know, give Japan resources and allow Japan to have the chance um, to do what they wanted. Um, so Japan has a lot of control over this area, um, and it's all because they have to have those resources for industrialization. And remember, they felt like they had been slighted at the with the Treaty of Versailles. Um, now, obviously, you can see right here by the key the different other territories uh, that were in control. Um, so what's going to happen is that in 1931, they invade Manchuria. And then by 1937, they've invaded this part of China. Um, when they invade that part of China, what's going to happen is you have horrible violence, right? And I think I mentioned at least to one of the classes about the rape of the city of Nanking. Um, you know, you used to have, first off, you have the Japanese who, you know, historically, if you look at the way they perceived China and China's foreign policy and why the J Japanese chose to interact with the world in a very different way, a lot of that goes back to a sense of cultural superiority. Japan had always seen itself as superior to Korea, superior to China, um, and, you know, really felt that culturally they were better than everyone else, and they're even better than Westerners. This is why they had such limitations on Westerners coming in. Um, and so when they, they start invading Manchuria and then when they invade China, um, they very quickly um, start committing atrocities, right? They, they don't care. To them, the Chinese are like dogs. Um, and so the, the more they can kill, the more they can intimidate. And they literally, they bash babies' heads in. They throw them out windows. They have beheading contests where they basically line up men and they just chop off their heads um, until to, to see who could chop off the most heads in a certain amount of time or whatever, or who would give out first. Uh, and the newspapers would actually keep up with this. And they would like report, oh, you know, so-and-so is beheaded so many hundreds of guys. Um, and then you also see that that with women, with the, whether it's Korean women or Chinese women, uh, wholesale rape of women. Like, And it, when I say rape, I mean, I don't think you can fully appreciate. We're talking about taking women, literally tying rows of women down to beds and letting the Japanese soldiers use them. Um, it, if they were lucky, they were allowed to eat um, and have something to drink. If they weren't lucky, then they were just left there until they starved and dehydrated. Um, so this is the kind of this is the kind of atmosphere that Japan, the kind of chaos they bring to China. Um, and so China is really a horrible mess during this period. Um, and so if you go back to when when do the atrocities start? When does the when does the territorial aggression start? It starts with Japan. Uh, in the 1930s, and it's because they want to, you know, accumulate those territories and maintain that control. And again, really horrible things happen in Japan. Um, and in fact, if you were, one of the things that keeps Japan from murdering as many people as, say, Hitler does with the Holocaust or Stalin and his rush to industrialize um, is going to be simply that they have to start, they, they're taking over territory, right? Um, they start to engage, you know, if you go back to this map right here, Right, you've got all these other countries that have territories, um, and so they have to really kind of be aggressive towards that. Plus, it's difficult to invade China. Right, China has a lot of people. Um, now, now one of the reasons they're able to maintain the control of these areas of red that you see has a lot to do with the fact that um, that China has kind of a mess itself, right? Remember I had mentioned that China had had an emperor. The emperor kind of loses his power, especially once the Japanese invade Manchuria in the early 30s. Um, and what's going to happen is that, um, it, is that the, you know, the, the 
communist Chinese are going to start battling with the nationalist Chinese over basically, you know, who actually runs the country. Um, and what will happen, and we'll, see, we'll talk about this a little bit more, is that the United States favors the nationalist Chinese. They see those as being kind of friendlier. Uh, they're of course, the big issue is the U.S. is nervous about communism. And this is before we've actually gotten involved in the war, so we can afford to be picky about who we're friends with, right? So we're more friendly with the nationalist Chinese. However, the nationalist Chinese are horribly, horribly corrupt. They're made up of a lot of the bureaucracy uh, that had been in place under the emperor. Um, and so, you know, a lot of the Chinese people are not very happy uh, with the nationalists. Um, and in fact, it's going to be the communist Chinese who are the most successful at fighting the Japanese. So they're the ones that are going to really hold the Japanese at bay. And they're going to do this without much help from the United States. And because remember, the United States recognizes the nationalist Chinese. Um, so just kind of keep that, that whole scenario in mind. Um, that This is part of why you have this whole dilemma in China, why the Japanese are able to kind of come in, but it's also part of why they, they can't quite get control over China because they're actually fighting two different forces rather than just one force. It's not like they can just go conquer the nationalists and then, okay, they've got control of China, right? You've got two battling forces within China itself that essentially has kind of a, a civil war as well as fighting the Japanese at the same time, as well as being concerned about European power. So Japan doesn't have the luxury of focusing in on atrocities for an extended period of time. Um, you have these fits and spurts of incredible atrocities, of lots of death and destruction, and then it'll kind of shift as they focus their efforts somewhere else. Um, just understand that the Japanese are not very nice in what they do, um, and that if we're talking about this notion of these dictatorships and the, the atrocities that are happening uh, during World War I, World War II, um, it's not just the Germans. We tend to focus so heavily on the Germans and. You know, I've got some theories as to why that is. Um, but fundamentally, um, the, there's plenty of atrocity to go around. There's plenty of bad stuff to go around. Um, so don't forget that. Um, and what we'll see happening is that the Japanese will begin to kind of sweep through these territories. And one of the things they'll do very early after they attack the Hawaiian Islands is they'll kind of sweep in and they'll ultimately get control over, like, all of this area right here. Um and they'll have this greater Southeast Asia co-prosperity sphere is what they call it. Um, and so this is why they're going to attack the United States. They know they've got to keep the U.S. out. You've got the U.S. controlling the Philippines here. You've got the United States with these islands right here. Um, they've, they've got to keep them out, especially after 1939 when Britain, of course, is busy with Germany and dealing with bombings there. Um, by this point, the Netherlands aren't particularly strong. And certainly by 1940, France has been taken over um, by Germany. And so French Indochina is not going to matter. So this is why by 1941, uh, at the end of the day, it's the United States they have to deal with. Um, and in addition, the United States, uh, be going back to 1937, not, not the invasion of Manchuria. We don't really pay a whole lot of attention to that because it's 1931, Great Depression, election year, all that, we're, we're busy, right? But by 1937, right, you've got... Um, FDR pretty solidly en en ensconced. He's won a second term, and he's starting to get a little bit nervous by what's going on. Um, so after the, this whole invasion of, of mainland China, especially events like what happened in Nanking, you're going to see the United States start to embargo Japan and try to try to remove key resources from them, resources of steel and oil. And at this point in, in history, the U.S. Is a, is a major oil producer, right? Um, and so this is really going to limit Japan's options. So one of the things that will happen in 1937 is us increasing this kind of uh, embargo and kind of stopping this, the flow of supplies into Japan uh, to punish them for their actions in China and Korea and that kind of thing. And what will eventually happen um, is that Japan's going to feel backed into a corner. Like, well, we have to strike the United States. We have to get them to sit out of this war. We have to get them to avoid um, being sucked into this conflict. And so that's one of the reasons why they're going to drop the bombs uh, on Pearl Harbor. So I think it's very important for you to kind of understand that. Um, let's see. Let's go back here. Um, the next one. Uh, here's Francisco Franco. Uh, Spain had was another country. This was another country that was dealing with kind of a civil war. Again, tensions between communists and 
fascist, nationalist, however you want to call it. So yes, we've got this period in the 1930s with a great deal of, of conflict all over. Uh, and in fact, the, the Spanish Civil War by, by most historians is considered an early proxy war for World War II. This is where Germany and the Soviet Union really kind of start fighting each other, even though they're not officially fighting each other, right? What you have is that Germany and Italy are going to support Francisco Franco and the Falangists, um, and, you know, you're going to have um, other, you know, the, the Soviet Union helping the communists, and you're going to have democratic socialists floating around over there. And so you've really got kind of a mess in, uh, in Spain um, that's going to make things very, very difficult. Um, and if you look at this map of Europe, 1941-42, uh, of course, this is actually after the U.S. would have gotten involved, but you can kind of see the extent of German power. Um, Spain largely sits out of World War II because of that Spanish Civil War, because by the time you get to 1941, Spain's a mess, right? Um, they're worn out. They've been fighting for, you know, seven years already. Um, and so Spain doesn't really have a strong government with which to engage in the conflict. Um, and so they're not a threat to anybody. Um, plus, you know, very early in 1941, or rather 1940, uh, you're going to have Germany getting control over France um, and establishing full occupation in northern France and having kind of a puppet government in Vichy, France. Um, you're going to see the, the Italians, of course, they're part of the, the Axis, um, so they're on the same side. Um, and so what will happen is that beginning in 1939, after uh, Germany goes into Poland and kind of takes over this area, um, you're going to have, Britain's going to kind of call, say, no, you can't do that. Um, 1939, you, I'm trying to think, you have the Berlin Olympics in 36. Uh, by 1938, you have Germany demanding that territory of Sudetenland, demanding that ter territory of Alsace-Lorraine. Uh, you've got kind of this policy of appeasement by uh, Chamberlain, where he says, okay, fine, we'll, we'll undo what we did with the Treaty of Versailles, but you cannot absolutely ask for anything else. And Hitler says, I promise, I promise, I'll be happy. I won't, I won't ask for anything else. Um, except then shortly after that, he starts talking about unification with Austria. And the whole deal with Austria is he claims that they're going to have an election and Austria is going to get to choose whether they want to unify with Germany. Except, of course, what will happen is that um, he'll say, oh, the communists are going to throw the election. We have to send troops in. We have to maintain control um, or the election won't be fair. And then they never bother to have the election. Um, and so this is how by 1939 he's got control of uh, got control of, of Austria as well. Um, the other kind of interesting side note that we see is that um, is that the, in 1939, about August I think it is, um, you're going to see Germany, Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union sign a non-aggression pact. Um, that's because Hitler's planning on invading Poland. He knows it's going to trigger a war with Britain because Britain had said after 1938, all right, if you ask for anything else, um, we're going to come to war with you. Um, and so he knows that that's what's going to happen, and he knows he has to keep that Eastern Front with the Soviet Union kind of quiet. Um, so initially they have this non-aggression pact. That's going to allow uh, basically the Soviet Union and Germany to basically divide uh Poland in half. So if you go back to this map right here, okay, so you've got Germany will sweep into Poland and cover this half of it, and the Soviet Union will sweep into the other half. And the Soviet Union is going to use that half as kind of like a buffer zone. And again, right, I mean, you would think communist versus fascist, they, why would they be interested in even talking to each other? Well, a lot of this has to do with the fact that, that Stalin wants to buy himself time um, I think he wants to claim that buffer zone. Whether or not he truly believed that Hitler would honor the non-aggression pact, I, historians still debate that. Um, maybe he was playing a long game. Maybe he really you know, believed the line. Um, but what we see happening here is that, um, is that Poland's going to be kind of divided. Um, and so that you're going to have Poland taken over. Now, this map goes into 1942. So part of what you're seeing here with this kind of lighter pinky kind of color on these arrows is going to be the invasion of the Soviet Union. Now, in 1939, you're talking about kind of a line that would have gone right here. Um, and so, uh, so you have in 1939... Uh, in September, they sweep in, they conquer Poland, they've got Poland under control, um, you're going to see that um, shortly after that, 
the United Kingdom declares war on Germany. France declares war on Germany because, hey, we told you you can't do that. Uh, <clears throat> and then he starts a sustained bombing campaign of Great Britain called the Battle of Britain. And so you have Germany launching these air raids, dropping bombs. If I have any uh, Chronicles of Narnia fans out there, um, you know, that's kind of the, the reason why those kids have to go off to the country is because London's being bombed constantly with the Blitz. Um, and so you see that happen in 1939. By June of 1940, you've got uh, Germany sweeping in through Belgium using the same old Schlieffen plan they used in World War I, taking over France, getting control, occupying northern France, having a Vichy government, uh, kind of a, a puppet government there. And so you have Germany having control over all of this. Um, and you can see that the blue is going to be the Allies. Um, after he invades uh, the Soviet Union in 1941, uh, the Soviet Union is going to become an ally of Great Britain. Um, but understand that one of the reasons why Winston Churchill and Britain don't really trust Stalin is going to be because of that non-aggression pact, and they kind of aren't sure what to think of him. Um, and so you're going to have kind of this real um, struggle. And you can see in 1942 um, the extent of German power. It was pretty intimidating and pretty terrifying in a lot of ways. Um, so be sure you kind of understand what that map looks like. Um, the next thing, and I'm almost going to stop here. Um, we'll stop after I get to that FDR picture because I've been going on for about an hour. Um, and understand that you have kind of this creation of the Axis powers. Initially, you have separate uh, fascist regimes that are in charge. Um, and what will happen is that they start to kind of get on the same pact are on the same t same page. Um, at first, it's because they all hate communists, right? We want to share information about the communists, and we want to be sure we know what's going on. Um, of course, obviously, going back into 1936, uh, 1935, you have Italy and Germany kind of getting on the same page because they want to kind of orchestrate the Spanish Civil War. Um, by the time you get into 1940, you've got Japan formally joining as part of the Axis. And part of why they're joining as part of the Axis is because of the U.S. embargo of goods and because they've swept into China and they're facing all this kind of frustration. And they're hoping that they can not only share information on communists, but maybe take each other's side against the Soviet Union. If you look back to... Um, this map right here. Remember that the USSR is awfully close to Japan. So if, if what you're talking about is trying to fight the Soviet Union and trying to keep control of the Soviet Union, Japan and Germany being allies makes a whole lot of sense. Now, in reality, they don't really, other than not liking the Soviet Union and not liking communists and wanting to claim as much territory as they possibly can, Japan and Germany didn't really like each other that much. But they, they're serving the same ends, right? Um, and so this is why they signed this, this treaty. Um, and so you essentially have them becoming the Axis powers uh, after 1940. Um, so understand all of that. And again, re recognize that, you know, strange times make for strange bedfellows, if you will. Um, and so you definitely see um, that this is kind of the, the way World War II begins to start. This is kind of the development of the Axis powers um, and kind of the global circumstances that are going on right there. Um, I'm going to stop here. Um, the next lecture I'll pick up with is going to be talking about FDR and American neutrality. So don't forget everything I've just told you um, because to understand really kind of how America is wrestling with neutrality and how FDR is trying to baby step the United States into engagement, you have to understand um, that essentially he is, you know, you've got this chaos developing by 1940. Um, so be sure that you understand that. So we'll pick up here with the next lecture. Um, yeah, I just thought this was going to be quick. Um, so anyways, uh, I hope you found this interesting. I hope maybe you got some good ideas for some interesting discussions.